If you are a fan of Freddie Mercury, and I'm pretty sure a number of you are, you have all heard of that magnificent concert at Live Aid in 1985. Do you know there's a connection between this and the history of the Cold War in the non-Western world? There is. Stay tuned. In a previous video, we studied the Cold War mostly in Europe, because most people associate the Cold War with places like the Berlin Wall. And the gist of it was that the world came very, very close to an explosion, the annihilation of the human race on several occasions, but because there were nuclear bombs in existence on both sides of the conflict, people kind of stayed away from starting an all-out nuclear war. So the result is that the deaths directly attributed to the Cold War on the American side are pretty limited. I think the number is 32 people that were caught spying and that kind of thing. But to study the Cold War simply within Europe would be a bit misleading because there's a whole wide world out there and this is what we like to do in the class. So how did the Cold War impact countries outside of Europe? Well, there are countries outside of Europe to begin with because, as we studied in another video, uh, this period, the 1950s and 60s, would be the period of decolonization, where in the span of 10, 20 years, dozens of countries became independent, uh, mostly in South, Southeast Asia, uh, the Middle East, and Africa. So that became a big question in the 50s, where will all these countries fit? Many of them were former colonies of France or Britain or Belgium, and as such would be on the side of NATO and the United States in the Cold War. Are they going to remain on that side? Or maybe are they going to flip and then become Soviet allies, which would completely change the balance of power in the world? Or will they just stay out of that conflict and remain non-aligned in that conflict? Well, that was a big question raised at the conference in Bandung, Indonesia, in 1955. And that was a very important conference, even though you probably never heard of it. Uh, it gathered up a lot of uh, countries that were either newly independent, especially in Southeast Asia, or were soon to be independent, as in Africa. And on the photo that you see here, you should see a number of people that we have talked about in the class, or will talk about uh, soon. Uh, people like Kwame Nkrumah, the first leader of independent Ghana. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first leader of independent India. Or Gama Abdul Nasser, the first leader of independent Egypt. Uh, along with some other people that we won't talk about in the class, but are still quite important. Uh, people like Tito, the leader of Yugoslavia, or Sukarno, uh, the leader of, of Indonesia, uh, the host country. So what was the question there at the conference? Well, what do we do now that we're independent, or so soon to be independent, where do we fit in the Cold War? And the decision was made was to not side with the United States, not to side with the Soviet Union, and instead to chart a third course, a non-aligned course. And that was the birth of what became known as the Non-Aligned Movement, or NAM for short. Uh, to understand the ideology is pretty simple. Uh, the movement was all against colonization, so it was pushing countries in Europe to decolonize what was still colonized in Africa at the time. Uh, but most importantly, after all the countries would become independent, to not pick sides in the Cold War, to be non-aligned. That the questions raised by the Cold War, such as whether Adam Smith or Karl Marx was right, well, that's not an issue that's very important in India and Indonesia. These are debates between European intellectuals. Or whether the Soviet Union the United States would control West Berlin. Again, not a question that is that important if you live in Ghana. So just stay out of the, the Cold War. There's nothing to be gained from that. Uh, this non-aligned movement turned into something quite organized, the non-aligned movement, which still exists actually to the present time. And historically, there were conferences every few years in various places from, I don't know, Bandung to Havana. And there were great hopes when it was set up because these are countries uh, that represented a large chunk of the world population. And they hope to create a third way in world affairs, what became known as the third world. And I know that when you hear the expression third world today, you're thinking impoverished country somewhere. But it had a very, very different meaning when it was created in the 1950s. Uh, it was done in reference to the third estate in 18th century France. And if you remember from the video on the French Revolution, the third estate was that class in France representing uh, the non-nobles and the non-clergy. So the vast bulk of the French population at the time uh, that paid most of the taxes, did all the work, and had no political representation. So the idea at Bendung was to compare those uh, former colonies to the third estate 
in pre-revolutionary France, that they would be the bulk of the world's population, do a lot of the work, and had none of the political power. And ultimately, if you united all these countries as one, as a third bloc, then you could have an important voice in world affairs, in a way uh, bring a new balance uh, to world affairs, which tended to be dominated by great powers in Europe uh, for centuries. Uh, this kind of uh, belief in unification is one that we'll also encounter in other areas of the world. Uh, after independence in Africa, many countries led by Kwame Nkrumah dreamed of creating a United States of Africa. And also in the Arab world under Gamal Abdul Nasser, there was also a plan to create a United Arab Republic that would unite all the Arabs. So it's kind of the same idea of a, a worldwide movement of unifying small countries to have a greater say in world affairs. And people really thought in the 50s and 60s, that's it. That's going to be the next big thing. That all these former colonies, now that they're freed from the shackles of uh, European imperialism, will now become the dominant force in world affairs. Well, how did that unfold? Uh, not so well, because you read the paper and you know uh, what the world is like today. Uh, go to the United Nations, and even though you have almost 200 independent countries in the world, and former colonies from Africa, or Southeast Asia, or Latin America, uh, tend to be the most numerous at the General Assembly, well, the General Assembly has pretty much no power. All the power at the UN resides within the Security Council, which is just 15 countries, and all these 15, 10 are rotating members, but five are permanent members with veto powers. And what are they? Well, round up the usual suspects. United States, France, uh, Britain, Russia, and uh, China today. So we still live in a world dominated by great power. So something went wrong between the hopes set up at Bandung and whatever happened uh, in the decades that followed. Uh, so what happened is uh, the Cold War, uh, that despite their claims of remaining non aligned in the Cold War, uh, most countries fit one side or the other. So why would countries pick sides in the Cold War? Well, money would be a big issue. Uh, these are countries that are typically poor and needed foreign aid in order to start development projects. A good example of that would be Nasser in Egypt. His big dream was to create a dam across the Nile River. Well, to finance it, uh, he kind of uh, played sides where he promised to be an American side, or maybe the Russian side, or maybe the American side. And uh, that was a way of starting a bidding war between the two sides where they would pretty much uh, get out a, a checkbook and buy uh, his allegiance in the Cold War. This was also a way to get allies in local conflicts. Uh, we talked before about India and Pakistan. Uh, these are two countries that, after independence from Britain, were strategic rivals for control of Bangladesh or the Kashmir region. And they wanted weapons. Where can you get weapons from? Well, in the Cold War, uh, Pakistan thought maybe I should declare myself an ally of the United States. This way I will get all the modern weaponry from the US. And in response, this India tended to side more with the Soviet Union so that they could get weapons uh, from that side. And you could see how, yet again, uh, you have another conflict uh, inspired by the Cold War where uh, the non-aligned movement uh, should have uh, existed. So the result of the non-aligned movement, even though it exists still today and has a conference every few years, has turned more into a, a beggar's group. Uh, it's more a way for poor countries to get together and ask for greater foreign aid from richer countries. And this is where we get the expression nowadays, uh, third world associated with economic poverty uh, rather than political power, which is what it was supposed to be initially. So that connects also to the Cold War because by the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, uh, the Cold War turned into mostly a battle for, for the non-Western world. Uh, because it was too dangerous to fight over Berlin or Germany, because that would for sure uh, lead to a nuclear war, instead the Soviet Union and the US decided to fight proxy wars uh, in smaller areas of the world uh, that might not as be as important, and as a result you could safely fight for them and it would not be too important, and you're sure that it will not lead to nuclear war. And that's where the bulk of the casualties uh, happen. Uh, if you look at the list of how many people died in the Cold War, most of them are outside of Europe. The single largest amount of casualties would be during the Civil War in China from 1945 to 49, probably 5 million deaths. Or in the war over the Korean Peninsula from 1950 to 53, possibly 3 million deaths in total. Or during the war in Vietnam in the 60s and 70s, maybe 3 million deaths. Or in the connected conflict in Cambodia uh, with the uh, genocide of the 1970s, and that's about 2 million deaths right there. Or in the war in Afghanistan when the Soviet Union invaded in the 1980s, maybe a million deaths right there. Or in Angola uh, in the 1970s and 80s, you have another civil war. So what about Freddie Mercury? You promised me some Freddie Mercury. 
Well, to understand the whole story, let's move away from Wembley Stadium for a second and move to the Ogaden Desert of Somalia. And if you don't know where the Ogaden Desert is, uh, I'll put a map there just to help you uh, figure that out. Well, in 1977, Somalia was an ally of the Soviet Union, meaning that the United States at that point would have supported uh, Ethiopia nearby, the strategic rival. That was kind of the rule during the Cold War. Uh, you pick two local rivals and one uh, would be supported by the US and the other one by the Soviet Union. Uh, well, in 1977, Somalia decided on its own to attack Ethiopia to gain control of the Ogaden Desert, which is a desert region uh, kind of abutting the border there. Uh, they did so without the support of the Soviet Union, and so the Soviets got angry about it and kind of withdrew their support for Somalia because they were the aggressor power. As a result, the Soviet Union shifted its support to Ethiopia, and as a result, the United States shifted its support from Ethiopia, which used to be a US ally, to the Soviet Union. And that sounds a bit crazy to be switching things like this all the time, but that's kind of the Cold War in the third world. You don't really care about which country is where. You only want to be on the opposite side from what the US or the Soviet Union is doing. Well, the result for the uh, people on the ground was much greater. It's not just a game for them. Uh, it turned into a major conflict uh, that was fought, fought throughout 77 to 78. And if you want to know who won, in the end, it was Ethiopia. Somalia was pushed back. What are the results for the people locally? Well, you have about 7,000 deaths on either side, which by the standards of 20th century warfare is fairly limited. Uh, what you do have, on the other hand, is a major regime change in both countries. On the Somali side, the regime that had started that disastrous war was eventually ousted, and that led to a lengthy civil war throughout the 80s, 90s, that in fact is still ongoing. And if you have memories of the time in 1993 when the United States intervened in Somalia because there was a major famine there, in a way it's connected to that conflict in the 70s, uh, that we're still trying to look uh, for a stable regime in Somalia. Instead, you've had clan warfare ever since. And this uh, was far, far greater in terms of the death toll than those uh, 7,000 deaths of the actual war. Uh, the result in Ethiopia was kind of similar in that you have a regime change as a result of the war and the rise of a communist regime led by a man called uh, Mengistu Meriam, a dictator that you may not have heard about before, but he is one of the most uh, deadly dictators of the 20th century. Well, what did he do? Well, the usual uh, political oppression that was common with communist regimes, something called the, the Red Terror in the late 70s, uh, but also he is directly responsible for that famous famine that you had in Ethiopia around 83, 84, 85. And when that was reported in the news back in the 80s, people assumed, well, it's Ethiopia, it's a poor country, uh, there's a drought, and so it's kind of an act of God, in a way, that people are starving to nest. The reality is that it was much more politically oriented uh, than you would think. Uh, the poverty in the first place was largely linked to the fact that Ethiopia has spent its meager resources on the Ogonet War. And even more importantly, uh, Mengistu Meriam was using that particular uh, famine as a way to punish his opponents. Uh, instead of just killing his opponents, just let them starve to death. So it's, in a way, a man-made uh, kind of famine. So how did we go from the Cold War to Freddie Mercury then? Well, after decolonization, there is an attempt by former colonies to establish a non-aligned movement, which in practice meant that many former colonies picked sides anyway. Specifically in Somalia and Ethiopia, which got embroiled in a bitter conflict over the Ogaden Desert, of all places. In the process, it switched alliances in the Cold War, so Ethiopia became a terrible communist dictatorship, where as part of the retribution against political opponent, the local dictator Haile Mengistu Marihan decided to let a famine unfold to destroy any opposition to his rule. That led to an outcry in the West, and the raising of funds at Wembley in 1985, and that's where you get the Freddie Mercury concert. That's history. Everything is connected. So you have a kind of a tragic story there, uh, where the big power politics of the Cold War play out in the Third World and eventually cause untold deaths, whether it's there or Angola or Vietnam or Cambodia or Korea. The major victims of the Cold War were in the non-Western world, and that was a failure of the non-aligned movement.
Well, in the next few days, we'll focus on two particular countries in greater detail to see how they shifted from being on the side of the United States to being communist allies. Uh, the first one would be the famous case of China under Mao Zedong. Expect a few more deaths there. And then the second case would be Cuba under Batista and eventually ended up under the rule of Fidel Castro. See you next time.